السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We always will continue praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask him to accept the few words of praise that we engage in and we ask him to allow us to lead a life that will be full of praise of his indicating that we really and truly praise him not only by our mouths but by everything else also we ask him to bless send blessings and salutations upon muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam who was sent to us in order to remove us from the darkness and to bring us to the light blessings and salutations upon all the previous prophets of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all their companions may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all i mean my brothers and sisters in islam there is a lot of excitement within me right now as I'm standing here for many reasons and maybe I can pause for a moment and explain. Firstly, I have a colleague of mine, Sheikh Abdul Bari, who I, whom I've just met again. We were in Medina Munawwara together, mashallah. Secondly, I have just met for the first time Sheikh Kamal and uh, I've heard a lot from him. I actually have uh, a joke that I took from him and I did make mention that one of my colleagues have said, and that was him. And that was the joke, if you guys know it, of the mango juice. Do you remember? It's there. Subhanallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all. Imagine I'm just remembering something because the first time I ever seen him was actually at that point when my wife sent me a little clip and told me, do you know who the Sheikh is? I said, I will know him inshallah. And here we are, mashallah, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're basically doing the same thing. And every one of us would like to draw closeness to Allah. And this is one of the other reasons why I'm so excited is to be able to share with you a few good words by the will of Allah, words of motivation. And you know the topic I will be speaking about today, but I want to introduce it in a different way. Seeing that I'm in Hong Kong, when I was going from the hotel, or should I say from the airport to the hotel, something strange happened. I remembered that I'd forgotten my phone at the airport at a certain spot, certain place. And so what happened is I told the brother, Brother Farooq, who was with me, I said, Brother, this is what happened. Let's, let's get back into the terminal and see what's happening. And mashallah, I decided at that point that if the phone has to go, it's gone, alhamdulillah. Two SIM cards, it has dual SIM, so two SIM cards. And the phone with whatever it is, alhamdulillah, you know, it has its little lock. And even if they open it, big deal, you know, the world will find out that this man's system has been hacked. But alhamdulillah. And I went in, there was a procedure of getting back in to, you know, before the customs and so on. And I got in and guess what? It was exactly where I had put it, exactly there. And today some, a brother Idris told me, he says, you know what? Like that generally the people here are quite honest, quite upright. You know, you will find things. And mashallah, that's very good because that is Islam. If you enter a Muslim country and you find people robbing here and there, they are not practicing Islam. But if you find honesty, even in the non-Muslims, they have a portion of what Islam teaches in them. And this is something that really was unique. It touched my heart. Another thing on a lighter note, as I was coming, I saw them saying, uh, th th there, was, there was a sign there saying, one chai or chai one. I don't know, what, which one was it? Chai one. <laughs> no, ch I think where we're staying is a place called one chai. So I was looking forward because I know in the Indian language, chai means tea, right? I said, they'll offer me a nice cup of tea there, subhanallah. And today when I was coming back, it was the other way around. It was chai one, meaning you left your tea at the back, and now you're going somewhere else. <laughs> subhanallah. So I looked at the brother, I said, hey, is this okay? He said, no, 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 it's just a different place. They swap it. So I said, okay. So I'm sure if this place is Hong Kong, there must be a place called Kong Hong. And he says, yes, there is. And I started laughing. I said, I was just joking. He said, no, there is a place called Kong Hong. It's a little area here. It's a little area. It's not a city or anything. Small area, they call it Kong Hong. So Allah make it easy. Now I learned that, you know, Ismail Mink is someone and Mink Ismail will be someone else. Allah Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. Brothers and sisters, Islam is not a religion of gloom and doom. You notice how we just started now? We're trying to be good Muslims. So am I. It's a trial. It's a life, a life full of trying to pass the test. And I want to start off by telling you that there is a big difference between a believer and a non-believer. A person who believes their outlook to life is completely different from one who does not believe. 
And this is something unique. It is something that you have to realize as a starting point. Because sometimes when I'm discussing with a person who does not believe, and you're talking about things, they only think in a specific way. And believe me, their norms keep changing in a way that sometimes is very embarrassing and they still don't realize. You know, recently we've seen the globe moving in a certain way, okay? And we all know that according to the global norms, Democracy is something that is looked very high up to and is considered a standard. But part of that democracy is the right to disagree. That's part of democracy. Which means it's my freedom to agree with you or to disagree with you. Yet the same democracy disagrees with our disagreement to some things. And this is something that the fathers of democracy are perhaps perpetrating, perhaps purposely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant the commoners like myself and yourselves a little bit more sense to understand what exactly is going on. My brothers and sisters, imagine if you were to say, or if someone, let's say, let's, let me give you a different example. If someone was to say, you know, I believe Islam is wrong. Are they right or do they have a right to say that? They have a right to say that. They have a right to d disagree with me. They have a right to believe that what I am saying is wrong. I have heard people saying Islam is barbaric. No one says anything. I have heard people saying Islam teaches this and teaches that which it does not teach. I have heard only silent or muted answers of those like myself and the others that are never ever perhaps, you know, circulated amongst the same people who are saying these things. And we have never heard a landslide sort of a response to it or the whole world making a big hoo-ha about why someone disagrees with Islam or believes in it that which is not really in it and therefore comes to a conclusion that it is a religion of doom and gloom and so on and it has no goodness in it. But if anyone has to disagree, for example, just disagree to say, you know what, I don't really agree with homosexuality, for example, just an example. I don't really feel, you know, that it's the right thing to do. If someone has to say that, the whole world will descend on them like they've never seen the evening or the morning. And then we want to say, you do not have a right to disagree with this. That's what the world is going to. So let's wake up and see what's happening in front of us. I have of late been studying something, you know, the movement, the, 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 the sexual sort of movement of mankind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And believe me, it's heading towards animals in the sense that there will come a time very, very soon when not only will it be the in thing to marry the sheep or the goats or the animals, but it will be wrong for you and I to disagree. You will be jailed if you disagree. Everyone's just looking at me. Ten years from today, we might meet again. Then you look at me differently. May Allah protect us. Because ten years back, where we were and where we are today is already proving certain things. It's proving points that we have no right to disagree when it comes to certain things. You have no right. But when people call you a dog just because you believe in one God, when people call you an animal just because you are a person who prays five times a day, when people call you a sadistic person just because you believe that there is heaven and hell after you've lived, then there is nothing wrong. They have the right to disagree with you. But when you say, my brother, I don't think what you're doing is wrong. I, I, sorry, is correct. I believe that what you're doing is actually not ideal or even if you just say it's not for me they will say I can prosecute you I can jail you and you perhaps will be jailed depending on who you are is that what the world is all about so this is why we say the outlook of a believer and a non-believer is totally different let me explain to you the mere fact that you and I are going to die proves that this life was not just to enjoy the mere fact that I'm going to die and you're going to die proves that this life has a meaning to it because if it was here to enjoy i would not die i would be living and excited and if i did well i would get more years the the more well you do the sooner you die eat more die quick have you ever heard that you know i can explain that to you from two two different ways subhanallah people say that you know when you eat a lot you become fat and you become sick and so on i don't really think so it depends on your so many other factors but let's just go on with what people say so they say if you eat this and if you eat that, you know, you die and whatever so quickly and cholesterol and so on and so forth. Okay, subhanallah. We believe as Muslimin 
that we do not live to eat, but rather we eat to live. In the sense that we appreciate the food, we will eat it, we will thank the Almighty, we will, we will know our limits when it comes to food. We know what to eat and what not to eat, and that is for a reason. And I'm going to get to that reason today, inshallah. But let me tell you something else. We do not just believe that you eat whatever you see and whatever you like just because you've seen it and you like it. No. And at the same time, we believe that the exact amount that you are going to eat is already written. It's already written. You need to know that no soul shall taste death until its sustenance is completely delivered. If one droplet or one grain of rice is written for you still, you won't die until you've actually consumed it. Then once you've consumed it, you go. So people say, well, I'd rather eat less because if, if five kgs of chicken is written for me and I eat five grams a day, then I've prolonged my life. But if I sit and eat five kilos at once, I'm dead. <laughs> it might sound a bit funny, but to be honest with you, that is all part of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will not understand the details of it, but we believe that Allah has in his hands and he has written completely exactly what we will have and how we will have before we leave. So I was saying the fact that you are going to die and I am going to die already proves to the mind that this life is not just to enjoy. You know, we are living a life that we believe is full. It's complete. I have, subhanallah, may Allah grant us all good health, control over my hands. I feel, I was walking up here. I know what I'm doing. I'm standing, I'm holding, I'm sweating. Hey, mashallah, 97 degrees or, or percent humidity, subhanallah. And whatever else it is, yeah, you're laughing. So we're not used to it. My brother, Sheikh Kamal, is the first time he's coming to Hong Kong. First thing I had to ask him was, how's the humidity? 97 percent, subhanallah. I'm sweating in an air-conditioned room. That's your Hong Kong for you. I wonder how it will be in Kong Hong, my brother. <laughs> so the truth is, I feel and I really believe firmly that I'm alive. I'm living. I'm, I've got a brain, a mind. Do you know what? What you have is not actually perfect. You will still have the perfect mind and body and everything else in the life after death. It would be an unjust Lord if he were to just create us to pass time in this world with no paradise, with nothing to come after, because this body is far from being perfect. The mind is far. My condition in this world is very far from being happy. In the sense of the materialistic word, not the spiritual word. There's a difference between the two. Materialistically, I would love so much more, but it's my spirituality that in reality, if I believe, would be of essence. If I don't believe it's all materialism, you know, in this part of the world, the religion in a lot of cases is money. It's money. Everything. Yesterday I walked into a shop. I forgot my little bar of soap back in some shower. So I came in and asked for an aqueous soap and they did not know what aqueous soap was. So I looked and I said, you know what? It's a bar of soap without perfume and perhaps, you know, suitable for little kids and so on. And the man gave me a bar. There was a certain brother with me. And he, it was written on it 4-0, which means he was supposed to charge me 40. He looked at me, I said, how much is this? He looked, he says, 60. I smiled and I gave him the 60 and I carried on. And in my mind, I said, may Allah forgive this man. Because 40 was for the soap. And 20, why did you forget your soap at home? That's what the other 20 was for. Subhanallah. So I thought to myself, I said, he's just worshipped his God. And to be honest with you, the look on his face was such that I just said, May Allah guide this man. Subhanallah. He didn't even want to see me. And I smiled at him and he just almost growled back at me. And I said, MashaAllah, I will not let myself drop in character just because the other man is growling. If I growl, I become the same animal. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may, may it not be. I didn't really have a bad thought, but I felt sorry in the sense that I said, I can't really read this man except in a negative way right now. And it's up to me to be able to thank Allah for what he's given me and to be able to say, okay, no problem. If this was your whole life all about, here it goes. It's okay. You know, it's clear where, where prices have been written and so on. And to be honest with you, I walked away learning a lesson to say for the sake of Allah. And this brings me back to something else. But for the sake of Allah, we should be helping one another. Do you know that there is a right that a visitor has upon you for three days? There was a time in Makkah al-Mukarramah in the 60s and 70s. Ask your parents and grandparents and those who've been for Hajj at the time. 
where the first three days, no one would ask you anything. You would go to what is known as a muallim, and you would sit with him, and what would happen is, three days you have a choice. He would feed you and he would stay there and everything. After three days, you decide whether you want to remain in Hajj with him or not. My father told this to me. And then, you know, you would say, okay, mashallah, he's a good person and so on, I will remain. They only start charging you from the fourth day. So I told myself, Ya Allah, if that had to happen today, we'd be three days here, three days there, three days somewhere else, three days until the Hajj is over. We have a free Hajj and we walk away, subhanAllah. But the life has changed. Today, before you go, you are charged. And guess what? If your flight is delayed, tough luck. Not only do you lose your accommodation because it's given to someone else, but you've paid for it, that's also forfeited. MashaAllah, so much about the rights of a Muslim upon another. So much about the, about the rights of a musafir, a person who's a traveler. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and calmness. So my brothers and sisters, a person who believes, would feel and would believe that this life is only a test, T-E-S-T, -E nothing else. I have come in, you know, I, I like to say you drop into the life, you lead the life and you come out of it. Others have dropped into the life, they've led it, they've come out of it. When you're going to go and how you're going to know was not left to you because you would never want to go and you would never choose a way of going. If I were to ask you right now, okay, how many years do you want to live? What's the age? What's, give me the date of death. When, choose your own date of death. People will say, hey, 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 I don't want to die. It's a fact. Not realizing that this is just a test. It's like in a school. You're enjoying the company of your teacher and so on. I don't ever want to leave the school. But you need a certificate. You need to graduate and go out to the real life in order to apply what you've learned and in order to be able to say, hey guys, I've got a qualification. I worked hard and here it is. That's what happens in life. This is a school. We are being tested one after the other. Monthly tests, weekly tests, daily tests, the major test. أَوَلَا يَرَوْنَ أَنَّهُمْ يُفْتَنُونَ فِي كُلِّ عَامٍ مَرَّةً أَوْ مَرَّتَيْنِ ثُمَّ لَا يَتُوبُونَ وَلَا هُمْ يَذَّكَّرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do they not see that every year we test them once or twice, major tests. This verse was revealed regarding the tests of Makkah and so on and the battles and whatever else has taken place. But the lesson is for every one of us, tested in a major way, once or twice in the year, yet they don't want to repent and they don't want to be reminded or they do not take heed. What about us? We have tests every day. Things go against our will. Well against our will, but because we believe, we believe the will of Allah is what overrides everything. You want, Allah wants. Whatever Allah wants will finally and ultimately happen. You work towards what you want, yes, but whether you achieve it or not is in the hands of Allah. If you do not work towards what you want, you've become a lazy person whose belief is somewhat, somewhat faulty. Because it's known as tawakul. You know what is tawakul? When a person says, Allah will look after my car, but the windows are open, the doors are open, and you just think that, you know what, it's okay, it's predestiny. If it was written for it to go, it will go. Well, if you've left it open, you're actually telling Allah, Ya Allah, sort it out. But Allah says, I have given you the capacity and the ability, and I've given you a role to play, and the capacity, ability to fulfill that role. Fulfill it and leave the rest in my hands, in a beautiful way. You say, nah, it's predestiny, do what you have to. Astaghfirullah, that is blasphemy, that is wrong. You know, people who don't want to go out to hunt for a job and then they sit at home and say, well, if sustenance is written for me, it will plop through the ceiling. Believe me, the ceiling might fall down. <laughs> Believe me, because you haven't understood the term destiny. Wallahi, you haven't understood it. Go out, work hard. The hadith says, Law annakum tatawakkaluna ala Allahi haqqa tawakkulihi la razaqakum kama yazuqu tayr the hadith says if you had to have the correct trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he would sustain you he would provide for you in the same way that he provides for a bird and it doesn't stop there he says the bird leaves the nest early morning with an empty belly and comes back in the evening or comes back later on Full, which means it went out to work and it worked hard. It flew for hours on end. It picked whatever it could and came back. That shows that you have to work towards something. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uk. Another narration says, work hard to achieve that which is beneficial for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us benefit. So why am I starting this way? Why is the talk starting this way? Because the foundation is far more important than what is to come. 
If you do not have a foundation, you will never understand why the dress code, why halal, why haram, why, is, why are certain things permissible, why, cannot, why can we not just do this and why can we not do that? Because if you have belief in you, you will know that there is a greater plan. This is part of a test. Like when you enter an examination, can you cheat? No. But what's wrong? I'm just looking. I've got eyes. I'm just extending my eyes to the one plus one answer of the guy next door. What's the big deal? Everyone knows common logic. You're not allowed to cheat. It's the rule. Can you take in your mobile phones? In most examinations, you cannot. Most examinations, you cannot. No mobile phone. No, sometimes a maths test and they don't allow you a calculator. Why? Because they say don't become lazy. At a certain age, you're not allowed the calculator. You need to know it just from your fingers or from your head. Someone says 5 plus 5 plus 6 minus 3 plus 5 plus 8 minus this times that divided by that. What would you say? Someone would say 1 already. They would know the answer. But some of us, we need to sit and say, okay, this, this. And still come up with the wrong answer. Because we're still used to calculators and so on. So Allah has rules. He has regulations. You need to adopt them. You need to abide by them. That's your test. Your test is beautiful because it's not just in an exam room. It's in something Allah has prepared for you known as the world. And Allah says, you know what? There will be certain things you're going to dig out of the ground. We will make sure that you consider them valuable just to make it a bit more interesting. What's that? Gold and silver. Where did it come from? Platinum. It came from under the ground. Africa. Wow, I come from Africa. Remember that? MashaAllah. So... Gold and silver comes from Africa, but it's used everywhere else. Have you thought of it? MashaAllah. And, well, one might argue it might not be that accurate, but a lot of it comes from Africa. Let's be honest. So, Allah says, if you think about it carefully, what is it? It's something very, very small. It's just something that they've refined and they've made it valuable. You know, it's become valuable. Gold, silver. Wow, wow. So, your life, you're going to have to come in. When you come in, you're naked. Meaning you're not unclothed, right? You don't know how to speak. You don't know how to say hello. And you come in, it's a test at that point for your parents as well. You will be clothed. You will be looked after. You need to learn to talk. You need to learn manners. You need to learn faith. When you get to the age of puberty, you need to start asking questions. Why am I believing what I'm believing? Everyone needs to ask these questions, even Muslims. Believe me. It's wrong for us to think, you know what, you're a Muslim. Don't ask why are you believing what you're believing. Ask it, you will find the answers. Then you will be believing with basira. Basira meaning you know why you are doing what you're doing. قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them, this is my path. I call towards Allah, but upon knowledge, upon conviction, upon knowledge, upon foresight, upon that which Allah has blessed us with. I am calling towards Allah upon sound knowledge, myself and those who follow me. So we will all call towards Allah upon sound knowledge and say, I am not from amongst those who engage in polytheism. I worship Allah and Allah alone. It's an amazing verse of the Quran because it teaches us that you need to question. You need to know the answers so that you can give other people the answers. So someone says, for example, why am I praying five times a day? Go back and hunt the answer. It doesn't mean that I must leave it for now. No, find the answer and you will be able to get it. Sometimes you will understand logic and sometimes you will not understand the logic, although it's there. And sometimes it's a matter of belief. Allah testing you like Ibrahim, the prophet Abraham, the Old Testament also declares that at a stage he was instructed to sacrifice his child. Okay, there is a dispute between the Muslims and the others as to who exactly the child was. We say that it's proven even from a historic point of view that it was Ismail. And the others say perhaps it was the other. But to be honest, Ishaq, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon him too. To be honest, the fact is he was instructed to do something that did not make sense and all heavenly religions agree with that. He was instructed to sacrifice his son. Did it make sense? No. No sense whatsoever. But the, the fact, fact that he knew it came from his maker, he surrendered to it because he knew this is just a test and this is just something that's going to come to pass and as a result I'm going to achieve something far greater. So he went ahead to fulfill the instruction, although he didn't understand it because he knew its source. And this proves to us. And like I said, this is not unique to Islam. This particular story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, 
you know, there is difference between the different religions and so on. But the fact that he was instructed to do something of this nature is agreed upon. Why? Have you ever asked yourself, there are certain things you and I will have to do that may not be so testing as that, but they will definitely be things that we may not immediately understand. Can give you a quick example. Can I give you a quick example? Okay. If a person breaks wind and they had what is known as wudu, they were upon the condition of ablution. What happens? They need to repeat that ablution, that wudu, but they never ever wash where they broke wind from. Thought of that? Someone might say, but breaking wind. Why did I have to wash my hands and my face? Come on. I'd rather have, you know, washed my backside. Subhanallah. May Allah protect us. But that is a test of Allah. It makes you arrive at a level of physical cleanliness as well as spiritual cleanliness, which sometimes you may not understand immediately. But you will feel it. We feel it. We know it. It's something, it's a condition. When you believe in the Almighty, spirituality overtakes you in a beautiful way. Beautiful. You feel things. You feel spirituality even in a person. And you feel spirituality, subhanallah, even when it comes to your deeds. You, you want to fulfill your salah because that plug in with Allah. You know, I was reading about something lately. Breathing and so on. And I'm thinking to myself, if you have to say to the world today that you know what? Take the, take the name Islam out of everything. But give the Islamic teachings. And market them without using the term Islam or Muslims. Believe me, the fastest and best selling. In fact, people are doing that today. People who are non-Muslim are actually doing that. They take Islamic teachings. They study Islam deeply. They remove Islam and the Muslims out of the picture. And they teach the same thing. They teach mannerisms, etiquettes, social conduct, so many other things, so much so that international law is also derived from the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So much so that so many things are actually taken from it, but they won't tell you that. It's just because people are somewhat fearful. Because Islam perhaps is, so, is growing so quick and is so big. That you know what, with us, I have a policy. I don't like to say, eh, fastest growing religion. Well, why must I brag about it? For what? Subhanallah. To me, it's my test. Like I said, you come into the world. You came without anything. You're going to be taught things. When you get to the age of puberty, you start asking questions. That is your test. And you know what will happen? You need to find Allah, worship Him alone. And you need to understand that he has sent for you a book. You know, recently I was faced with a certain very embarrassing situation where a man who was a Christian was sitting next to me. And you know, we have a policy of respecting all. We are human beings at the end of the day. So basically, I sat, I greeted him and so on. And we had about one and a half hours together because of the flight. And so he tells me, you know, the Quran is a satanic book. I said, have you read it? He said, I just read a few snippets. I said, snippets. And you're telling me satanic book? He says, well, the Bible is far, you know, more superior and so on. I said, okay, hang on, hang on. We believe in the original manuscripts of all these faiths. We believe in them. And the truth is, I'd like you to swear to your maker that you will read the Quran and you will read the Bible. Read it cover to cover. And you tell me which sounds more heavenly. Because according to you, the only heavenly book is the Bible. According to me, they were all heavenly books, but some have been changed. And the translation is watered down in spirituality in a very, very big way. But I want you to read these books and you tell yourself, I have to pick up one at the end of me reading these books. And I have to say, this is the one that has more superiority. It is more fit to be the word of God than anything else. You do me that favor. He says, I will definitely do that. Believe me, I don't know what happened as a result. But for me, I told him, my brother, I know what you, if you are a true human being, true human being, and you've read these scriptures, all of them, and you tell yourself, pick out one that is definitely something of the high, the closest that it could be to the word of God. According to you, who's not a Muslim, you will come up with the Quran. I've read the Bible. I've read a lot of scriptures, a lot of manuscripts, a lot of different people's beliefs and so on. Believe me, nothing touches me as much as the Quran. And that's because I'm a believer. Yes, but I want to tell you, even the disbelievers 
from the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran has something in it that is so amazing because it's the word of Allah. I always tell the non-Muslims, do me a favor, read the book and then tell yourself from all the books I've read in my whole life, I have to choose one that I firmly believe is the closest to what could be the word of God. I'm only using this as language because we would be addressing non-Muslims, you know. I mean, I believe it's the word of Allah. I definitely have no doubt in it, not a single speck of it. Never have I and never will I, inshallah. But I want to tell you something. When you're talking to a non-Muslim, you cannot shove things down their throat. But sometimes they have an Allah gives you an opportunity because of some reason for you to reach out to them in a beautiful way. And this is why when I, anytime I get emails or I get messages of people who swear and they call you barbaric, I tell myself, Alhamdulillah. Do you know why? Most of those who accept Islam are those who swore it before. In, in my experience, from my experience. Those who really thought it was bad. So when someone says it's barbaric, that's a beautiful step because now they've, Islam is in the limelight to them. It's there. It's now a showcase. You know, but if a person's not bothered, ah, I don't mind. I'm not even interested. It's harder to get hold of them. But here it's already there. All you got to do is just say, read, keep on reading, find out. You get your questions answered from the right source and let them keep on carry on. Subhanallah. I'm sure you all know brother Anud Van Dun. Subhanallah. Or you may know him, you may not know him. We met him also now in Dubai and his son accepted Islam. This man was responsible for the movie against Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was belonging to a party that hated Islam and the Muslims and he did whatever was in his capacity at the time to harm Islam and the Muslims. And he says later on, obviously Allah showed him the light. Like I said, he accepted Islam and he says, I feel so happy to read the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab who had gone out to harm and he came back with guidance. Amazing. So this is why I say when someone comes out and starts attacking your dress code, your, your dietary code, for example, all the other things, hang on, it's an opportunity, but don't mess it up. Don't mess it up. You know, it's like one day there were a, a group of little teenage girls and I got an email telling me this and she says, you know what, uh, we were moving with our friends and when they, when they called us something, we called them back the same thing. So I'm just imagining dog, dog. Okay. Monkey, monkey. Wow. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. May Allah safeguard us. That's not how it works. Somehow you've got to break that circle. Someone calls you a dog, you don't just start barking. Otherwise you prove that you are. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You need to relax, take it easy. Someone says a dog, prove to them. Who is the dog? Allahu Akbar. Neither me nor you. See? I think you must have thought I'm going to say, they the dog. No, they're not. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So my brothers and sisters, as you are leading your life, you have rules and regulations you will have to live by. There are people who have not lived by them, they also died. There are people who have lived by them, have also led a very happy life. If you look at people who are religious and spiritual, for example, you will find something unique in them. They may not have the world, but they have happiness and contentment right up to the last moment. Even whilst they are dying, Alhamdulillah, you know, you're actually saying, I'm going back to Arab. I'm going back to my Lord. I hope and I wish and I pray for his mercy and for goodness after this day. But for the rest, you know what happens? It started when you were born and it ends when you die. If that's the case, you won't ever understand why does a woman have to dress in a specific way? Why does a man have to dress in a specific way? Why? In Islam. You see, the brothers, sometimes when we say men have to dress in a specific way, huh? I didn't know that. Huh? No, we have to. We also are not allowed to wear tight clothing, you know, and so on. And that which is revealing intentionally, you know, you're revealing yourself and making like you're a big strong man. And so, no, 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 no. You're also supposed to, there are certain rules governing how you should be dressed. You need to dress modest, cover yourself. Clothing should be not so tight fitting, meaning it should be loosely fitting you and so on. Uh, subhanallah. And another part of your dress code is that you lower your gaze. That's part of your dress code. Did you know that? Lower your gaze. And I'll explain to you why. In fact, let me tell you now. You see, in this world, can you have whatever you see? Question. Simple. Can you have whatever you see? I see this, I have it. I see this, I want it. I, and even whatever you work towards, will you always have whatever you work towards? The answer is no. So Allah is telling you, hang on, you're a believer. You're not just a person who thinks that what you just have this life 
So whatever you can get in it, get it, whether it is okay or not. Because you believe there is a life after where you will get whatever you want. So in the meantime, in order to pass this test in a happy way, we will give you certain things. I mean, you will all get married. I remember when I was young, when I was 13, high school, we just went in. And you know, boys, we're all talking and so on. And we're thinking, hey, will I ever get married, man? Subhanallah. Today we're sitting with two wives and seven children, alhamdulillah. By the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at that time you think to yourself, subhanallah, will I ever get married 13, 14? Yeah, I can't wait. Four, five years left. Come on, six years left. Be patient. Hang on, relax. But Allah says, even if you get married, you will not be happy if you don't follow certain rules. You will always be a person who's still hunting. But brother, you married. You know, a long time ago, I remember seeing profiles in, in like shadi.com and, and what muslim matrimony.com and what have you. You look at a profile and it says single and looking or it says something else. I can't remember. But never do you find married and looking. Then I thought to myself, it's because they don't have the option there. That's the reason. They don't have the drop down. Had they had it, majority of the people would be that. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. I don't mean the Muslimin. Meaning I don't mean they would be that, but I mean there's so many people, they're married, but they're still looking. Looking at what? It's because they don't understand. Lower your gaze to appreciate what you have. Because you will never ever get what you're looking at. No, you won't. Never. So look down and say, Ya Allah, you've given me, I thank you for it. Let me carry on now and start achieving other things in life. This is why I was speaking to a brother of mine and I told him, that you know what? You clock the age 35, perhaps 40, sometimes a bit earlier, I hope not later. And you start realizing, you know, I'm married, I've got kids. I need to start working for the next generation. It's not all about me having fun. Now it's about time I help my kids having clean fun in, the, in a way that will lead them towards Allah and lead a balanced life and so on. So now you calm down, you relax, even your metabolism slowers. Do you know that? Even your metabolism slows down. Everything starts changing to say, hang on, you know what? You now have to die. Now the life is for the others. Did you pass the baton on or not? Or are you still busy hunting to say, I need to get married and I need to do this and I need to have more kids. So on. Subhanallah. If you want to do things in a permissible way, nobody's going to say no. But, well, hang on, your wife might say no. That's if you understand. But the truth is, the truth is, you, you need, need to, to look, look down. down. At, at a certain, a certain point, point and say, say you, you know, know what, what, what I, I have, have, I thank, thank Allah, Allah for it. Now let me work on my salah. Let me work on my link with Allah. Let me work on charitable deeds. Let me work on other things in life so that I can die a happy person. Because if you're materialistic, as I was driving here today, I noticed a Nissan GTR. And all I remember is the advert splashed over all of Dubai airport some six months ago where they had a Nissan GTR and Usain Bolt, you know, about to, to race with that GTR. And, so, and I saw the car and I said, wow, this is the vehicle. And immediately I, to, I, I told myself, if we were people who ran behind the dunya, that this would be my next kill. Do you know what that means? I would say, wow, I need this. And next thing I'd be phoning here, phoning there, making money from here and there by hook or crook and we have the GTR. Then, then what will happen? Let me tell you what will happen. Allah has kept it such that as soon as you have something material, there will always be something slightly better than what you have that's also available in the market. Every time, no matter what. Do you know the, the, the Samsung 5S or S5 is out, right? To be honest, as soon as you have it, someone will tell you, did you try the HTC? And someone will say, the iPhone is much better. And before you know it, the Samsung, the Samsung I'm saying Samsung, we took out the S. The Samsung 5.5 is out. I didn't know they go in 0.5s. I thought they went in, in, in a whole point. They said, no, we modified one little thing. So now you say, okay, give this one away. Let's have the other one. And they think about it so deeply because there was a time when people like myself never used to change phones because we thought my contacts and I'm going to have to change this and change that. Now they tell you, no, relax. Do you have a Samsung account? You know, all you got to do is just press update or press backup and it's done backup restore and it's restored into your new phone they've even thought of that but all this for me as a believer goes back to that original teaching which would tell us that if you run behind materialism and the world it will always run faster than you block yourself with some breaks and start concentrating on something real what is real the fact that i'm going to die is the most real and certain things a certain thing ever so people say, I'm going to die. I'm really going to die. I don't want to die. Well, you have to. Wow. You have to. 
Wallah, it's a fact. People say, I'm going to die. I really don't want to. But everybody died. You know, Michael Jackson died. I don't know how, but he died. Do you know that? And everyone else died. And everything happened. But we hope when we die, we're not bad. We're good. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. You didn't get that. Wasn't Michael Jackson saying he was bad at one stage? There we are. So when we die, we've got to be good by the will of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. A Muslim, we don't want to die. No, it's not like that. It's not like I want to. The hadith says, La wal maut. Don't wish to die. Don't. To run away from your problems, I want to die. That's not Islam. You have to go through. That's your test. Imagine you, you O-levels in my part of the world, and you, you've worked for so many years, and you come into the exam room, and you say, I can't write this test and I walk out. Come on, write it down. You might have some marks at least. And you know what's the goodness of Allah's tests? If you just say, Ya Allah, forgive me. I'm sorry, I won't do it again. And so he says, okay, you get 100%. Done. Amazing. That's the beauty of Allah. So this is why we say, believe. And it will answer all of your questions. You need to, because the reality is, if you do not believe, your whole outlook becomes very short. It's only for 70 years. And after that, he led such a beautiful life, people will say. But where are you? That's the point. Your money didn't come with you. It didn't. Like I always say, wealth, to amass it is easy. But that's not a deed. What makes it a deed is the way you spend it. It becomes a deed. You convert it. Perhaps the way you earned is also a deed, but of a different sort. But if I have a lot of energy and I'm a strong man, powerful weightlifter and so on, people will say muscular. But how I used my muscle is what becomes a deed. It makes it a deed. For now that I have a muscle, big deal. That muscle is going to die as well. And it's going to go into the grave and perhaps decompose as well. Then what will happen? People will say, he was a big man. Where are you right now? You're gone. You're somewhere where nobody knows, only you know. And you know who else knows? Your maker. Whoever made you in the first place. That's whom you're going to go back to. This is what Islam tells you. That your whole life must be focused. But Allah says, hang on. I'm sending you for a test. But I want to make the test so interesting because... Because I want you to have a time where you can enjoy yourself as well within my obedience. So Allah says your exam room will have something known as money in it. It will have parents in it. It will have children in it. It will have persons of the opposite sex in it. It will have, you know, so many other things in it. It will have lots and lots of items, motor vehicles and what have you and technology and everything in it. All we want you to do Make use of all that within what we have ordained. So Allah, Allah does not say, you're not allowed to talk to a woman. But Allah governs how you should, when you should, and what you should be saying. And how close you can get to each one depending on how official you are with them in terms of relation. Remember this. Remember this. And if you don't want to look at those rules, well... See what happened to those who have ignored them. Never happy, never content, always a problem, always something going on. Believe me, look at the superstars and the superheroes of today. And the most, according to the world, the most gorgeous of the women of the lot. And even the most handsome of the men, according to the norms of today. And I'm talking here of the material world. They, you study the lives of some of those people, most of them, if not almost all of them. They have so much in terms of depression, antidepressants, so much in terms of everything else negative in the world. But the show is beautiful. Do you know what's the show? I look so nice in my high heels and my Givenchy, whatever it's called, right? And my, my Chanel and what have you. And I'm walking and the smell, everyone turns around. Wow, your own husband doesn't look at you. What's the point? What's the point? Your own wife don't look at you. What's the point? Where is it? Who are you trying to impress? You have 10 million followers. Wow. But you don't have happiness. Wow. Every one of them wants you. But you know what? The one who has you doesn't want you. Oh, thought of it. Why? Because we don't understand. It's not all about showing the world my hair. I said it. I'm not too sure if it was here or elsewhere. You show someone your hair and let the whole world's men Say, wow, nice, lovely, good, excellent, brilliant, whatever. They telling that to another 500,000 women at the same time. No big deal. No big deal. And another thing, you can have the best on the globe. There will come a time when it starts dropping. You won't want to show it. You need to go and dye it because it's now gray. 
Allah says, because that's not what you were all here for. You're not just here for your hair. Hair is, by the way, appreciated. Let someone who is supposed to appreciate it, appreciate it. And at the same time, we want to tell you that there will come a time when we will prove to you that it means nothing. Hence, guys like us are bold. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. It means nothing. SubhanAllah. It's just the gift of Allah. He's going to take it away. He takes it away sooner. You know, King Faisal, SubhanAllah, somebody sent me a message yesterday and they said, a person asked him and says, how come your beard is black but the hair of your head is white? You know, meaning, hey, you, you die, you're doing a dying job, man. You know, how come the hair of your head, head is white or gray, should I say? And how come your beard is black? So King Faisal was a sharp man, Allah Yarhamu. He says, well, the hair of my head is 20 years older than the hair of my beard. SubhanAllah, wow. What an answer. What an answer, SubhanAllah. So the hair goes, it actually disappears. And you know what? The hair of your head goes before the hair of your beard. I don't even know the hair of a beard going. Once it comes, it's there to stay, I hope. And then there's brothers who tell you, you know, I really want to keep a beard, but I want it like yours. Man. You know, mine grows here and this side don't grow. And here it's a bit longer and there's excuses, excuses. Thank you. Don't worry. Let it grow one side. They'll call you the one sided man. Mashallah. <laughs> Subhanallah. Don't worry. Let it grow. That's the will of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. But my sisters, I need to tell you something. As much as we are people who believe in self growth, meaning you grow at your pace. Remember one thing, we do not judge in the sense that we will not say this is a bad sister, this is a bad brother, this is this, this. No, 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 no. But we have to encourage one another to do good. That is not judging. That is just encouraging to say, listen, you know what? This is what you're supposed to be doing. And this is why you're supposed to be doing it. I have a certain sister who, who told me that, you know what? And, and I believe she's a very good sister. She reads a salah and so on, so many things. But she says, there's certain things that I feel need changing in my life before I cover my hair. So I can easily cover my hair, but I don't want to right now because it will give the wrong impression of me being all saintly and yet I'm not. And so I said, do you know what? Allah makes easy for you whatever you can change immediately. So do so as and when and how it is made easy for you. And not only that, do what Allah wants as best as you can. So if you're telling me it's easy for me to cover my hair, but I don't want to, I would tell you, well, that's a mistake. Because if it's easy for you to cover it, cover it. So what if people say you're saintly? As it is, when you're not covered, they're still going to utter words. You know, it's like the donkey story. They will always say something about you, about me and about everyone else. That's part of your test. You will have people telling you, you're like this. You're not like that. People say, oh, you know what? Islam preaches terrorism. Uh, you and I know that it doesn't. But people are going to carry on saying things because of ignorance, because sometimes there are people who use the name of Islam to do things. I give you an example. Look at what happened in Nigeria. 200 girls taken. And then they use the name of Islam. It's the furthest away from Islam. There are no such teachings in the whole of Islam. And to be honest with you, Islam is put on the block just because some Muslim dude or some guy who claims to be Muslim is doing that. One wonders what exactly is the motive behind it. So much so that there are so many conspiracy theories that it frightens us to think about them. May Allah protect us. So we cannot just say, you know what? We are afraid of what people will say. No, be worried about Allah. Because if I were to die right now, right now, where am I going to go? Everyone will say good man. Maybe people will say bad man, whatever they say becomes irrelevant. It becomes irrelevant. It's my link with Allah now that matters. What did I do to prepare for the day I died? I tried to dress appropriately. I tried. What did I try to do? To be honest with you, there are rules and regulations in Islam. Can I share something with you? These rules are not unique to Islam. If you look at the true Christianity and true Judaism, they have similar rules of dress. Similar. This is why you take a look at a nun. Okay, they've modified their dress from time as time passes. The skirts become a bit higher and so on. You take a look at the original nuns. They dress just like a Muslim woman should be dressing. If you take a look at the Jewish women, Orthodox Jews, to this day, they should be dressing and there wouldn't be a difference. So much so, wallahi, without a joke, you can go and check it on Google. The Orthodox Jewish men need to wear niqab. Do you know that? I've seen it myself. If you travel a lot, sometimes you get to see some real weird stuff.
well, let me not call it weird, but to be honest with you, something that is different to you. When I say weird, I don't mean, you know, something derogatory, but I mean something different. And men, men wearing covering besides their eyes showing and they had hats and so on. SubhanAllah, Google it, find it, you will see it. Amazing. It's something, you know, and yet we say, but these women, they're oppressed. You know, it's shocking sometimes how our own Muslims don't understand. My brother, it's not oppression. You're doing it because you want to do it. If I were to make an announcement here to say all the women in hijab, if you are being forced to don that scarf of yours, put up your hand. Nobody would. And you know what the media will say? It's because their men were seated there. Allahu Akbar. But it's a fact. It's a fact. Take a look at halal food. Today we have dietary restrictions. Anything that's unhealthy is prohibited. Unhealthy. Take a look at a swine or pig, pork, whatever you want to call it. Unhealthy. Science and medicine have confirmed that it is unhealthy. But still, because it's cheap and it's widely available, it's marketed. And it's sold. And it's made to seem like it's so tasty and so on. No, it's unhealthy. Do you know that true Judaism and Christianity also consider it prohibited? Did you know that? But no, that was watered down and changed. But because Islam hasn't changed, people are saying, when are you guys going to change? Come on, it's about time. You need to change. Start eating the swine. Start eating pig and so on. Start eating bacon. You don't know how yummy it is. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. May Allah safeguard us. These are all strategies to get you to a place where you left with no faith and you left depressed and you left sad. And the day you die, it's you and the little swine that you ate. Allah protect us. Really, what was the big deal? I'd rather stay away from things knowing that that's part of me passing my test than to do things and put my whole afterlife at risk. You have one life to prepare for the everlasting eternal life after. Don't mess it. Be strong. If you want to accept Islam, do so now. If you're a Muslim who wants to accept Islam, do so now. If you're a non-Muslim who wants to accept Islam, do so now. Not after five minutes or tomorrow. Do so now. I tell you why. Because this opportunity may never arise again. This is why we say, Ya Oh, you who believe, enter into submission totally, completely. Oh, you who believe, become submitters. In other words, be proper Muslim. Oh, you who are Muslim, be proper Muslim. Oh, you who are non-Muslim, enter into Islam. That obviously is not part of the verse, but I am saying that. That if you are not Muslim, enter into submission. If you submit to the will of the one who made you, when you return to him, you're a happy person. And what doom and gloom does Islam have in it? All it has in it is rules and regulations that will ensure you're a happy, healthy person. That's all. So for example, if the blood of the animal is still in the animal, we say haram, do not eat it. It's not been slaughtered in a humane way. If an animal is clubbed to death, we will say, don't eat it. If an animal was fed with fodder that is unhealthy for you and I, we call it Jalala. We will say, quarantine it for a certain period of time before you slaughter it. So even if there is a cow or a chicken or a bird or anything else that is made to eat things that are unhealthy, you know, you have the mad cow disease and you have the mad something else disease and so on. So many diseases every day that are coming up. We as Muslimin believe if the animal has been fed with that, that is, with that which is dirty, filthy, unhealthy and so on, quarantine the item depending on the size of the animal for a certain number of days and feed it with fodder that is healthy for it and make sure that you have treated it properly. Today, if you were to take a look at the duck market or the chicken market, you might be shocked as to what type of chickens we are actually eating sometimes. But if you're eating halal, then by the will of Allah, that is looked into. When the animal was, when, or let's say the bird hatched, from that point, how was it kept? How was it fed? What happened to it? Did you treat it in a humane way? Do you know so much so that even when the animal is being slaughtered, and you know people don't like the word slaughter, okay. But then, you know, one day I was sitting with a group of people and they were telling me, these were non-Muslims, and they were telling me about how barbaric halal is. You know, you guys actually cut it with a knife? I said, well then, how do you want to cut it? And the guy just looked at me. God, I never thought of that. <laughs> there you are. 
We just follow the trend. Halal is barbaric. Halal is this. They actually spill the blood of the animal. Well, maybe your burgers are made of what? Paper? Plastic? What else? <laughs> Subhanallah. To be honest with you, your burgers are perhaps clubbed to death. And you know the animal must have been cursing you before. And now you're busy. Yum. At least with us, it was the name of the giver of the life was taken. And therefore, we've taken that with utmost humanity and, and you know, with a lot of respect and with acknowledgement to the giver of that life. And at the same time, we make sure that one animal does not see the other one die. That's the proper way of doing things. Do you know that? The proper way, you don't even show the knife. You actually, you, you make sure that you know what, this is done. Not everyone's a butcher. But ask the butcher, he will tell you. And a butcher is not a barbaric person. You know, there was a certain girl who told me, I've got a proposal, but I'm fearing. I said, why? The man's a butcher. Oh, wow. And I thought to myself, well, what does he butcher? Does he... Does he not, is he just meat or is there anything else, you know? Because that, otherwise all the women, subhanAllah, use knives in the kitchen. Does that make you a terrorist? No, it doesn't. You're busy, you know, slicing beautiful pieces of chicken. But a while ago, if you looked at that chicken in your face, you probably wouldn't even want to cut that chicken anymore. SubhanAllah. But that's Allah. That's Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cut it humanely in the name of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happens? You will enjoy the meal by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But those who don't want rules, they eat anything that moves. Have you come across that? I think in Hong Kong it's known. In Hong Kong it's known. Anything that moves is eaten. Why? Because sometimes, to be honest with you, people are lacking in belief. They forget that all the money they earn in this world will be to no avail when they die. When I die, and this is why, you know the gift of a true believer is death because that's the end of your examination. Now Allah gives you something beautiful. So when you're old, you should be reminded of your good deeds. You engage in lots of istighfar, meaning seek forgiveness. And you have hope in the mercy of Allah, you're going to a better place. Not like where everybody says, what a nice person. He did so much. You know, he, he was one of the wealthiest person in the world. So successful. She was the top musician on the globe. You know, he had albums that clocked 50 million and he did this and did that. But like I said earlier, in the grave, will all that help? Is there a sheet or a paper written right, clock 50 million, did this, earn so much, did that, did... No, your deeds. What was your link with your maker? Did you discipline yourself? Did you look down? Like I said, this morning I tweeted something very interesting about clothing. That clothing is not just what you wear, but clothe yourself in a more beautiful way with your character, your conduct. And for a mu'min, clothe yourselves with piety, taqwa, closeness to Allah. Allah says this in the Quran, the clothing of piety is the best. And this has deep meaning in it, not just the physical clothing. Let me tell you something. If I'm a person who has tatty clothing, but I am, I've got so much positivity beaming from me, and I'm a spiritual person, religious person with a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my clothing becomes irrelevant. Irrelevant. And if I am the smartest guy on the face of the earth in terms of my dress, but I'm a crook, no one wants to talk to me. I have a bad mouth. Nobody would want to talk to me. Anyone, I just look at them. You know, that look, that look. No, you need to humble yourself. No matter who you are, ask yourself, have you touched this life in a beautiful way so that when you get to the life after, it will come as a deed. It will come as a deed. May Allah grant us goodness. I just recalled something. Yesterday I went to hunt for my phone. I told you that at the beginning of my talk. There was a lady who helped me. And believe me, she was quite stern at the beginning. And when we were finished with my phone, subhanAllah, she actually smiled. Thank you very much. Okay, I said, oh, have a lovely day. And I walked away. And she just looked at me and smiled. She must be thinking, wow, I had such a different picture of guys who look like this. And look at this man. He's speaking to me. He's wishing me a good day. Wow. And I didn't just say, have a good day, and walked away. That's hypocritical. Have a lovely day, ma'am. Walk away. Subhanallah. And then I thought to myself, I'll get this smart Muslim telling me, but you're a Muslim, you're not supposed to have done that. Do you know 
Islam that you're coming to tell me that you're not supposed to do that. You're living in a non-Muslim country. And this is something many people don't understand. You have an environment of people who really, really have a totally bad picture of you. They don't even know. And you're busy trying to apply things in your life that you yourself go against when it's suitable for you. I remember a man who told me you're not allowed to speak to a woman at all. And one day I was on a flight and he was busy chatting the hostess. And I'm thinking, oh, is that not a woman? Wow. You know, I didn't know that transgenders also did that. May Allah protect us. Really. It's something strange that you know what? When it suits you, you'll talk about the dunya. Well, what about me when I want to promote my deen? Can I not talk about that when it's much more important? I remember a man, a quite a religious man. And he came to me. He said, you know, you, you, you promote mixed gatherings. And I said, no, I don't. And he says, okay, I might have been somewhere where there might have been something, but it doesn't mean I promoted it because I visit airports and train stations and so many different places. And I, I happen to sometimes sit next to people of the opposite sex. I got nothing, no say over that, right? So this man tells me, no, very bad, haram. You know, you're a sheikh, we don't want to listen to you. I said, look, nobody said you need to listen or not to listen because there are hundreds of thousands of others that you could benefit from. Paradise doesn't come through my path. Remember this, I always say this. There is not just one sheikh on the globe. There are hundreds of thousands. But the problem is if we keep on saying this one's bad, that one's bad, this one's bad. Take the goodness and leave whatever you consider an error. Leave it out. But مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا وَيُؤْخَذُ مِنْ كَلَامِهِ وَيُرَدْ Imam Malik ibn Anas says every single one, you take some of what they say and you have to discount some of what they say because of their human nature. Besides Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's the only one, you take absolutely everything. Imagine, Imam Malik ibn Anas rahmatullahi alayhi said this. So, me and you are actually people who are far down the ladder. You will have to discount some of what I've said perhaps. You may not like it. It doesn't mean that you will not benefit from me or I will not benefit from you. You will benefit from everyone where and how you can benefit according to that level. So much so that I've benefited so much from people who are Jewish in fields that are not religious sometimes. I've had teachers who've been Muslims, non-Muslims, and all sorts of other faiths who taught me mathematics and biology and geography and so on. I benefited so much from them. I took whatever I could in terms of the goodness. But the day they spoke about something that I felt this is now stepping territory that I shouldn't be taking from, I didn't take it. But I didn't swear them in return. I took. So if that's the case with the non-Muslim, what about the Muslims? Amazing. You have so many people every little while you see a clip saying, be careful of this man, be careful of that. Be careful of the whole world because you have to be careful. Subhanallah, you have to be careful. I am careful and so should you. But if I've said something that helps you, thank Allah, perhaps pray for me. It doesn't make me a prophet. Nor does it make me a person who's, wow, I now need to worship this man because of so and so. No, I am a human just like you with the same struggles. Perhaps even struggling in a bigger way, who knows? But we just look at things from a different perspective with the light of revelation. And that makes us content. That's what it is. Makes us happy. May Allah bless us. So, like I was saying, subhanAllah, people look at you and they tell you all sorts of weird things. You know, you are like this and you relax, take it easy. These are rules that govern us. And we know the reason is we need to pass this beautiful test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I was telling you that there was this man who was really telling me, I'm not going to do this and that because, you know, the way you do this and do that. And subhanAllah, I told him, I said, you know what? You have a business. The last time I walked into your business, I saw you. And I'm saying it not out of hatred or anything. I just want to raise a point. The last time I walked into your business, I saw you sitting and chatting with a woman behind the counter. You know what? The counter is there. Behind the counter, there was a woman who I didn't see exactly how she was dressed, but it was definitely dress code that was Islamically, you know, not in the picture. And uh, you were busy chatting and having tea. And so on. I walked in and I greeted you. He says, yes, I remember that day. I remember that day. And he gave me the name of the person. I said, wow, there you are. You even know the name. So why were you chatting? He says, that's Darura. That's Darura. I said, what do you mean Darura? He said, you are the guys who teach us that necessity will make prohibited permissible within the necessity. I said, oh, wow. Okay, okay, okay. So he says, it was Darura. I said, what type of Darura was that? He says, no, 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 no. I have to survive. I have to earn. I have to, I have to put a plate of food in, you know, for my family at the end of the day. So I had to talk to her. 
because she was my big supplier. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm neither saying you are right, nor am I saying you are wrong. Because that's your decision, your darura. You said it was a darura. You said it was a necessity. I am telling you, your necessity was related to your dunya, which means your livelihood and your life. My necessity was related to my deen. And I think that is much more important than what you found necessity in. So if you find me being kind to someone, do not come and tell me darura, darura in your style and in your time and because of you and not look at my own darura, which is perhaps of a far higher level. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. And I walked away. And sorry, I didn't really yell at him the way I was yelling at you right now. But I was just raising a point. My brothers and sisters, the beautiful deen of Islam. Now, I'd like to tell you something. To study the dress code of a Muslim, the dietary restrictions of a Muslim, and so many other restrictions and rules and regulations, it's not enough to just talk for a little while. We can conscientize you, we can motivate you, but you will have to go in depth. You will have to study. You will have to attend workshops. You know when they have the Halal Expo. Go and have a peep. Travel to it if you can. Invite them to have it in Hong Kong sometime. Halal Expo. And you will find out why. So much so, Wallahi, I know of non-Muslims who only consume Halal. Because they found out what it is. Now just to clear a few misconceptions. Halal is in no ways meat or food that hocus pocus has been chanted upon. No. When I say that, I've come across people who have said that, how can you eat this halal food? You know these Muslims, they just say, Habra And next thing you eat the meat and you just love Muslims. If that was the case, I think the world would all be perhaps lovers of Islam and Muslims because the meat out there, a lot of it is halal. Halal is merely, you know when something is certified halal, all that that logo is saying is that this meat has been processed in the most humane way with the blood being drained. The animal was kept properly. It was fed well and the blood was drained in a specific way. And subhanallah, just like the Jews and the Christians, these Semitic religions teach during the taking away of the life, the permission of the giver of that life was sought by way of mentioning his name. Bas. That's all. Bismillah. Why am I saying Bismillah? Because what gives me the, the right to take away the life of a cow? I didn't give that life in the first place. I am, I am entitled to life just like the cow is entitled to life and just like the other things are entitled to life. So I need to use the method that the giver of the life has actually ordained and that is you want my permission? Firstly, don't hack it, don't kill it. Do it in a humane way and ask the name of Allah, the giver of the life, Allah. Or as we were to say in the case of the Jewish and the Christian people, it would be the same. They would say in the name of God and slaughter it. In the name of Allah, slaughter it. In the name of the giver of the life, slaughter it. All this would render it halal. The blood is spilt, the clean animal and so on. So this is why recently there was a clip doing its rounds regarding halal food. And there was some television station in the States. I actually have that clip on my phone. It was sent to me a few days ago where there was a certain woman, one of the famous women of, of the globe. I don't remember her name. And she said, we must all boycott halal for this Thanksgiving because the turkey that is being served is actually, it has a halal logo on it. So, mashallah, do you know what the host did? The host of the show, he actually said, well, if you want non-halal turkey, then you need dirty turkey that has been bashed, you know, clubbed to death and that has been smeared in defecation and so on. And that is really turkey that was fed in with the most dirtiest of fodder and so on. And have that for Thanksgiving because that's non-halal. But if you know what halal is, and this is a non-Muslim talking, if you know what halal is, you would actually know that what you've said is wrong, totally wrong. Amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us regarding halal. But this is only one small aspect of halal. Halal comes into how you earn. Your money should be halal. It should be clean. You're not allowed to crook people. So that's halal income. People say Islamic finance. Islamic finance. To this day, there is a lot of Islamic finance that I personally have not understood. I'm just being honest. There are about three or four dealings that I would really be able to say, okay, this I understand. It's straight. It's from the hadith and so on. Otherwise, have you noticed I stay away from it? Why? Because I don't understand it. You might say, what? You don't understand? I really don't. I'm just being honest and open with you. 
that if you tell me this is Islamic, I say, but hang on, relax, leave it for the scholars who've understood it. Because you know what? I can't shoulder the responsibility of all this yet. Because I just don't have the brain to understand how it, the hadith fits exactly here, you know? So basically, sometimes I am also one of those who thinks, what's the difference here, man? I'll be honest with you. That's why I say I just stay away from it. There are a few things that are genuine, but we respect the opinions of those who feel, okay, yes, it's okay, mashallah. I am taught and I grew up being taught that you respect the opinions of others. I might disagree with you, I respect your view. It doesn't mean because I disagree with you, I need to fight you, call you names and kill you and so on. Never ever, no. I might differ with you, but I'll study your opinion. You study mine, we continue, mashallah. And that's how, inshallah, Allah bless us. I think one of our topics is going to touch a little bit on this. But at the same time, for a person to buy halal chicken, halal chicken and beef and burgers with money that he stole from someone else, that's wrong. With money that he earned through means where he consumed usury and interest, that's wrong. So let's go back and make sure when you say Islamic finance, it actually means I've earned in a way that there was shared profit, shared loss. And at the same time, all parties have either benefited or we have been in it together. I have not usurped, extracted, and I have not, uh, uh, should I say, uh, I have not cheated anyone in any way earning this. That's halal income. I've been clear and open. When you sell your car, say, look guys, it had a scratch, a dent on this corner here, and I repaired it. But this car is almost brand new. Be honest, this is where it was. But to say, no, it was never dented again. And you're busy looking at the corner that was dented. Never. It was not ever dented. The money you've earned, something wrong with it. It's contaminated with falsehood. That's what it is. So earn halal. Be honest. This is why the hadith says, regarding the people who buy and sell, فَإِن صَدَقَ وَبَيَّنَا بُورِكَ لَهُمَا فِي بَيْعِهِمَا If the two are honest and they are open, upright, then Allah grants them barakah and blessings in their deal. But the minute they cheat and they cover up and they lie and they are deceptive, there is no blessings in the deal. You might earn a lot of wealth, no blessings. The same happens in our lives. My brothers and sisters, it is about time that we covered ourselves beautifully with the law that Allah has endowed upon us to lead a life in a clean way. And when I say this, if we were to do that properly, you read your salah, you dress appropriately, you make sure you eat halal, you make sure that you do that which is permissible, abstain from that which is bad, respect others, bear in mind that everyone thinks differently, reach out to them in a way that they can see the beauty in your deen, by the will of Allah, they will see that beauty. They will be attracted to the beauty of the deen. You know, moments ago, someone introduced me here and he let the cat out of the bag, believe me. He says, I did a bungee jump. I did a bungee jump. Okay, that was some time back, don't worry. Uh, the truth is, like I said, when I started here, Islam is not all about doom and gloom. I remember when I did that jump last year sometime, I had a few Malaysian friends with me and to be honest with you, I got messages from scholars of Islam whom I look up to, to say, Shaykh, haram to Bilallah. It's totally forbidden and engage in tawbah to Allah. And I replied saying, Shaykh, I invite you to jump with me next year. <laughs> Subhanallah. Because to be honest with you, okay, we've taken all precautions and everything. It was something that just, I just needed to tick off my list and I got it ticked off. You know, skydiving is almost ticked off, inshallah, by the will of Allah. But there, it's actually a brother of mine who's blocking me. He's saying, look, there, there's no strings attached, brother. You know, here at least you've got strings. If you pull this thing and it doesn't go down, it doesn't open, what happens? And I say, look, what are the chances of it? Well, there are chances. So basically, we're still getting there. But the reason I'm saying this is, you can enjoy. You can enjoy your life. But within limits, don't do something haram. Because if you do something haram, and I'm going to end with the statement, if you do something haram for the sake of enjoyment, it will bring about everything but enjoyment in your life. If you do something haram to make yourself happy, meaning something prohibited to make yourself happy, it will bring about everything but happiness. Remember this. So if you really want enjoyment and happiness, just make sure it is within the line and the limit such that when you leave the world, you will go a person who's utilized whatever time and space he's been given and whatever abilities he or she has been given in this short test known as life. 
in the best way so that when we earn the certificate, it will be given to us in the right hand and we enter straight into paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannah. I hope the few words that I've said have touched the heart. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.